Everybody. Welcome to today's Information City Lecture. We are pleased to bring you these lectures because we feel that there's a digital divide and there's also an Information City. And the two of these things, uh, the two of these concepts are doing battle today, doing battle in our society. So, um, and we are, we are learning about things and we are also part of the solution here at Illinois. And in this particular class, it, it backs up this lecture series. So our MO is that the speaker of the day is always introduced by students, and today the student is a visiting speaker is a same student who is here for one semester from our sister school in France. And the name of that school, for those of you who don't know, is good because it's the top school in France, and it is called NCIV. Or for those who want to know the details, it is called the École Nationale Supérieure de Sciences d'Information et de Bibliothèque which is really a lot like the graduate school of the great information science, where we all are. So with that, we'll be on to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Laura Freyrich was a graduate student of the University of Illinois College of Media, and she served as student body president at the Urbana Champaign campus. Now, she is the University of Illinois Research and Director of Economic Development for the University of Illinois Urban Campaign Campus. She is responsible for managing startup company services as an enter enterprise West technology incubator. She, she is responsible for marketing the research staff and for supporting the university's economic development efforts. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me and your class today. So I'm going to tell you about Research Parks to begin with, a little bit broader of what's happening across the landscapes of Research Park. I'll focus on North America primarily to begin with, and then a little bit about incubators as a, a mechanism for supporting entrepreneurs, because certainly the democratization of entrepreneurship and trying to make it accessible and not just limited to places like Silicon Valley and Boston is a key theme that I hear a lot in the professional work that I do, and so I thought I'd share a little bit more of that. Um, before I do that, I'll say thank you to Sharon Johnson and others in the Graduate School of Library and Information Sciences that have helped to connect our tech companies to this wonderful program on campus. Uh, companies continue to hire more students from guest lists in the different enterprises and have repeatedly told me how pleased they are with the outcomes they've had with students, how impressed they are with their education, and the increasing importance of informatics in their own businesses, whether that's knowledge management or data curation or market research or patent research or whatever it might be. There are so many different areas that you really could apply the skills you have here beyond maybe traditional library settings. And I think that that's an important thing that's happening across our companies is the importance of uh, being more interdisciplinary and um, seeing the importance that information can play in their businesses. So uh, to begin with, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this idea of research parks. Uh, it's not a new one. Research parks have been around since uh, the granddaddy of research parks in the US is maybe credited Research Triangle Park with doing it first here in the US. That was nearly 75 years ago when three universities in North Carolina decided that they would create a triangle area and that that would become a tech location. A lot starting to change, and actually the Chronicle of Higher Education just wrote a very interesting piece a couple of weeks ago about the Research Triangle Park and how they are trying to redefine themselves because what used to be big corporate campuses co-located in um, several miles of each other is not quite the same as being an immersive community of companies located on a college campus or that are actually inter interacting with one another. And so that's sort of a trend that I'll talk a little bit more about, but that recent article I thought was quite interesting to see the, the research research park that we all admired even changing itself and um, thinking about how they uh, work with companies and students differently and employees. So across the world there are many research parks. Uh, research parks um, could be defined in a few ways. They're tech parks, they're industrial parks, they're research parks. The business I'm in is university research parks or university tech parks, which means that there's usually a, a large research university that has taken on the activity of creating a land area where they will attract businesses. They usually support entrepreneurship in some way, and they may have federal labs or some other component of research that's incorporated as well. In addition, federal labs themselves are doing research parks. So 
Sandia in New Mexico is a good example of a strong research park associated with a federal research lab. But all of us in common have something is that we are coming at it with an academic or a research type of context versus truly just a real estate play is what I would say. When it's done effectively, it's trying to bridge industry and universities effectively together in that setting. So about 700 or 800 of them exist around the world if you looked and um, interviewed our peers. And uh, in the US, there are roughly 120. And you see a map down there of where these locations are. Importantly, uh, for many times when we talk about the roles of research parks is that they are not limited to the coast. And in fact, many of them have been built across um, university cities that are located outside of mainstream large cities. Although they have also started popping up in, in urban environments. And that's really due to this change of more live, work, play types of environments as well. The activities or missions that they have associated with them usually is that tie of how do we get universities and industry talking to one another to create startup companies and have a nurturing home for them and to have regional economic development. So in almost every case, they're going to tout job growth, economic impact, tax impact that they have in their communities and trying to create universities as a driver of their economy. Um, so, oops, sorry. University research parks versus tech parks. So I kind of talked about this as being something that, um, I lost it. Just slow. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, so uh, university research park versus something that's simply a tech park. As I had already indicated, usually there's a university driving it. There's also usually a master plan of some sort. Um, it's meant to be usually a larger than a single building and larger than a single incubator. They usually have uh, part of their vision that they will transform the region in some way. And a key difference, as it said, is the affiliated research institution must have buy-in. So typically these are not done entirely by a private entity. Usually the university has some sort of staff associated with it. And commonly they're, they're creating some type of a nonprofit organization that's a hybrid of private industry and the university to carry out these activities. In the case of Purdue, for example, which is featured there, it's their private foundation. So the University of Illinois has a foundation. That's not where we choose to house our research park activities, but that is common for some of the tech transfer offices as well as research Develop, research park developments. Um, also, in some cases, there have been multiple institutions that have come together to do these types of activities. So when we talk about industry relationships, that's usually one of, as I said, the key goals. And that can happen in a variety of ways. In our park, we see that routinely. Uh, but generally, we want to see how we access research labs on campus as one of the things that uh, these operations are trying to do. We don't want to replicate everything that's on campus. The proximity to labs such as clean labs or microscopy suites or our animal facilities or whatever it might be, hopefully is an asset that creates a geographic reason for being here. In our case, of course, we have NCSA, the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. Many of the companies, when they open operations, will cite NCSA being here, the biggest supercomputer on a college campus, as a reason to enable them to have some sort of IT or a analytics type of operation. In actuality, many of them don't use it. Um, but it was credibility that was important for many of them to cite this location in a place that the National Science Foundation said is the home of big computing. So sometimes assets like that are really a differentiation that validates a location. And then, as I said, one of the key things is certainly the workforce. And I'll talk more about workforce as probably being our most important asset that we have here. So the research park here at the University of Illinois um, was developed with a purpose of furthering economic development. Recently, when she arrived at the University of Illinois, went on a listening tour of interest areas to different constituencies, and one that emerged was economic development. So that's recent leadership highlighting that as an importance, and I'll say she's been very committed to that and actively working to attract companies to this location. However, um, this went back to 2000 before her arrival. The state legislature decided that it was going to be our mission, somewhat whether we liked it or not. Um, the universities, public universities, are increasingly under pressure by state governments looking to fund them to show job growth and to show an impact on their economy beyond research, teaching, and service that they would have had traditionally. So we added economic development to our mission in 2000. And the university set aside this land, which had been ag property, for this purpose. They also set out to create an entrepreneurial ecosystem. And I'll describe some of those services as a part of it. 
So the research park opened in 2001. Um, with that, they decided to do a public-private partnership. They hired a developer to construct the buildings, essentially on their behalf, so they would not invest university money into the buildings, but turned over university land that could be leased to the developer. So we land lease on 50-year increments to a developer then constructs the buildings, who then leases them to the buildings. But it's really the university that helps bring the companies here. And it's been important because we can help define with the companies what their activities will be here, who they should be working with on campus, what types of projects they should be doing here with us, and hopefully aligning with our own interests as well. Job growth has been consistent over the last four years, so we're up to nearly 1,600 employees here in the research park. And of those, about 475 currently are students. So students are playing a key role in the employment and the workforce of the research park. Something that we're often cited for and some of the awards that we've received have been about this combination of startup activity and corporate activity happening in the same location, sometimes in the same buildings. And so different from what I described in the beginning of creating isolated corporate operations, I think it's a much more rich environment and offers up a lot more opportunity when we have the chance to intermix the companies, to allow them to learn from each other. The peer sharing elements are really important. And it's been, as an example, uh, I talked about the role of graduate students in library and information science work working in companies in the park. Um, John Deere was hiring students in that area before others in many cases. And then they started telling the other companies that they'd had such a great experience that the other companies started wanting to do it also. So things like that that we try to really encourage that if you don't have open dialogue and you don't have a cohesive community that perhaps you're not creating uh, a shared experience and one that really allows them to learn and prosper because of the, each other's success. So the area itself, as I described, is about 200 acres. If you look versus the core campus area, which is here, actually it's about the same size as all of the main campus area. So it's a really large area. Uh, we are uh, fortunate in being able to do this activity is that the university is a land-grant institution known for its reputation in engineering and ag. And our ag facilities remained right adjacent to campus for all these years until around this time period when they realized not only did they want to build a research park, but that our agricultural facilities were quite antiquated and old. Um, tomorrow, Governor Quinn will be here to announce uh, a new building project related to one of our existing ag facilities that will be completely modernized and recreated in another location to address feed for animals and being more precision in our nutrition and sciences and teaching. So as an example, although these uh, facilities were able to be displaced per se, uh, they also were able to be greatly modernized versus the 100-year-old facilities that had been there prior to this development. Now the area itself, as I'd said, could be developed because it was uh, available from prior ag usage, but it's also immediately contiguous with campus. And that's afforded us something quite different than some of our peers. So if you visit Purdue or if you visit Madison, they have thriving, strong research parks, but they're quite different than ours in that they're remotely located. So they're about 10 or 15 miles away from campus. And the primary difference that I've noted is that they don't have students working there in the same way that we do. And so we're really proud of the student role that we've developed here and I think it would not have been possible but with but for the proximity that we were afforded by this location. Okay, so if you went here in 2000, I graduated here in 1999, and that's about what it looked like out that way. It was not an area that anybody visited for any real purpose unless you were studying animals for some reason. In fact, there were fish ponds there, there were cattle, there were sheep, there were pigs, there were a lot of different animal facilities there. And so it's really quite remarkable that over this period of time, it's completely transformed. We've built a new building every year since it opened. And now there are 90 companies plus, and I'll describe some of those. But my favorite picture is this one, which is the, the cattle right outside the sign that says, please lease space, basically in our thriving tech park. So this was quite an absurd thing to begin with, that Champaign-Urbana was not necessarily a destination known for private industry to set up operations. Yet there was bold leadership and said this was possible. And really what happened is the snowballing started when many companies started to come here and others wanted to replicate what they were doing. So success begets future success and taking certainly the risk at that time to see what was possible. Um, so since that period of time, we've obviously added a lot of different companies. And as a result, the economic development impact that we have has been realized from that mission that was created back in 2000, where we are contributing to the local tax base, as well as creating jobs. 
um, one of the important things uh, from an economic development standpoint is taking land that had been not property tax eligible, that's university land, is the university's property tax exempt, and by building private buildings on that land, it becomes property tax eligible, which then helps the schools, the libraries, the park districts, and others to have a taxable source. And in addition, the payroll, um, the jobs in the research park are very high wage jobs, and I'll describe some of those, but not only do they have the direct uh, wages, but then indirect and induced jobs that result from them as well. So the corporate operations that exist in the park are very diversified. It's one of the things that we enjoy most about the work is that it's not one particular sector. If you look at different tech cities across the US and you may hear of certain themes, certainly Boston is known for biotech, San Diego biotech as well, and Silicon Valley um, is good at many things but largely known for um, digital media software types of companies. We think that one of the things that's really great about our park may be harder to market, but it's the diversity. So not only do we have people who are really great at software, and that's a key area for us, but we have people who are addressing technologies and scientific areas of many different application areas. And I think that creates a really rich and rewarding experience for the people that are there. Uh, many of us, I think, enjoy being in Champaign-Urbana because of the very high educational attainment rate of our community. Uh, it's not uncommon to bump into somebody who has a graduate graduate degree and can tell you about some expertise they have and whether that's history or English or some scientific domain, there are a lot of smart people in this town and I think for our companies located in the park, the ability and proximity to be next to people in many different scientific fields has been important to them to show how they're being used in industry. So the companies in the research park are all over the place in terms of sectors and we specifically do try to court companies that are in an area that we don't have yet. Um, so we're always in process of finding new companies. Um, two of the newer companies that opened include Granger, which is the largest industrial supply company. Many people know Granger on campus as a name because of the Granger Library, the engineering library on campus. When I was in school here, I never knew that that meant anything more than the name of a building, when actually the fortune that made the money that donated the building and then helped to give us now $100 million for new faculty hires and part of our ECE building funding was because this man became very wealthy on a business that was called Granger, which is still now a Fortune 500 company and sells equipment to many different types of industrial settings. They're opening a new operation. They actually have already started here on Internet of Things, which is an emerging topic of not just having uh, devices that integrate with software, but having devices that are smart and have electronics and mechanics and um, software components all integrated together. And then another new operation that I won't describe in a lot of detail is AbbVie, which is uh, formerly Abbott Pharmaceuticals, which is all around um, also a joint interest in informatics and in software. So bioinformatics is certainly something we're seeing emerging as an interest area at the university. So the companies are here. I already said the secret sauce to it is the students more so than maybe the original founders would understand. Uh, we want the companies to work with campus in a variety of ways, and they do. But the reason they usually open in the first place is our students. So why? because everybody wants lots of smart people to work for their companies, and it's tough in certain fields that are particularly attractive. Um, the most commonly recruited positions right now are software and data sciences types of positions. So your ability to uh, talk, I think, certainly about your skill sets and informatics is right on for where people are. And it's not as simple, I would say, although I'll uh, note that computer science is very recruited. We often encourage our companies to think more broadly about that topic. Um, computer scientists alone aren't necessarily necessarily the best informatics expertise area or data analytics. They need to have other nuances to be incorporated in addition to coding. It's really the taking the information and making it actionable or decisions around it or the visualization of that information that's important as well. So students working in the research park, as I had already described, being a key part of our success. Um, they represent about a third of the workforce. The most common types of projects we see are modeling and simulation and business intelligence, as I would said, um, user interface design, things like that. And these are just examples of types of degrees that uh, people go looking for, um, just to give you some sense of the workforce itself in the park for student recruitment, the types of projects that we see in our job descriptions from the last year. And I'll note guest list, one of the top areas that people recruit from. Um, students start 
as early as freshman year, and so the, the youthful environment we have is a neat thing as well. Um, companies starting to recruit because the, lar the longer they can uh, have that student working in their operation, the better their retention rates are. Students work 10 to 20 hours a week, and um, they work full-time in the summer. They are almost all paid internships. It's very rare that something would be just for course credit, um, and they're paid better than other jobs in the community. We have lots of ways to hire students, and I'll just mention one in particular for the University of Illinois. One of our assets is that um, we have many smart students in scientific areas or technical areas, but we also have a large international student base, uh, the largest university for um, international students of any public university in the U.S., and hiring students is still a challenge. Uh, many of you know the immigration debates that are happening but unfortunately have not been solved yet, and that means a lot of students that might seek to be hired either while they're in school or post-graduation that are still challenged, and um, it's even greater on the entrepreneurial side where international students are quite constrained in ability to start companies. Um, on the employment side, the university has played an active role in helping with employment of students. Students on an F1 or a J1 visa can work in the research park. We hire them through the university and allocate them to the companies, which allows them to perpetually work for companies that otherwise could not hire them on their own. So that's one of the ways the university has been proactive in addressing this need. Uh, this picture at the bottom is Abbott um, trying to recruit Chinese students because our company Companies are not only recruiting uh, for their local operations, but seeing their businesses increasingly be global. So um, I had the good fortune to be in China this summer with the University of Illinois and visited Anheuser-Busch and Caterpillar and GE and Caterpillar, or, uh, I'm sorry, Caterpillar Abbott and AB InBev that are in the research park as well. Um, although they're in the large cities in Beijing and Shanghai, they're sending projects from there to Champaign for expertise in analytics. So it was pretty neat to see how things become full circle. Uh, the projects that are done here are a number of areas. I won't go into much detail here. I'll give you specific examples. Uh, but when we recruit a company in, it's not as simple as just saying, move to Champaign and start doing something. It actually takes a lot of work, and in many cases, we work actively for years in creating these operations. We help to scope the projects, what they, sh what they should work on, what's appropriate to maybe have students engaged in or with the local talent that's available, the recruitment of students, the office planning components, recruiting full-time people for their office and trying to match skill sets, and then trying to engage them on campus with whatever things that might be best to them. And there are a variety of ways that we would choose to do that. Enterprise Works is the incubator. So the incubator facility is located in the center of the research park. That's where our offices are, and that's where the startup companies are. There are about 45 resident companies at a time, and they come from a variety of areas. Everybody assumes that we will have um, primarily IT companies, and that's actually not the reality. Um, most of our companies are some sort of other scientific area, although we do have composition of that as well. Um, and I'll, I'll describe some of those for you. So our companies, of course, we want to be successful, and how they're successful could be defined in several ways. Um, the companies um, certainly need help to be able to commercialize, or they're probably not a company. And so getting them the help of how do they uh, effectively sell to customers, or how do they even form the business, or whether it's a valid idea in the first place, is often sorted through our entrepreneurs and residents. We have seven entrepreneurs and residents, and they are providing free consultation to our companies. Uh, they're all people who've been in industry before and have had successful exits, and so any student, staff, or faculty member from campus can come meet with them and get help for free. So we pay their consulting wages, so that's accessible to get high-quality advice. Uh, we also have a lot of companies that rely on SBIR funding, which is Small Business Innovation Research Funding. Every major federal agency sets aside 3% of its research budget to be awarded to small businesses, and that's a key source of funding for small businesses and associated with universities often. And then, of course, venture capital. And we We've had our companies raise $722 million in venture capital since the research park opened. Some of the pipeline programs that we have to get companies interested in coming into the park or prospective entrepreneurs include a lean startup training program. The lean startup concept was developed by Steve Blank at Stanford and has been replicated all across the U.S. as a better way to do business planning versus creating, a, say, a 40-page business plan and then going out and seeing if it works. Going
go talk to a bunch of customers and sell some sort of minimum viable product or concept and see if it sticks and then keep iterating your product thereafter. So we've had a lot of teams go through this now at the University of Illinois and National Science Foundation site is here and um, it's a lot of calling on customers. It makes people a little uncomfortable. It's professors and graduate students that all have to report every week on how many customers they talked to and what advice they got and whether there was any traction in a certain area and defining their value proposition. And so that's about six or seven student, student and faculty teams at a time that do that over an eight-week period of time. We also fund a lot of the early stage um, programs that, that entrepreneurs need, so everything from legal to business to um, marketing assistance. These are our EIRs that I described. And another component that I like that we added is a designer in residence. So another emerging trend, if you're doing software development or you're doing a device or whatever it might be, the importance of design. So the Fine and Applied Arts School works with us quite a bit now. And um, Dina McDonough from Industrial Design works with many of our new start startups to create not only something that works from a technical standpoint, but that has empathetic design for the user embedded up front. So we have a bunch of students that do work in that space. And so on campus, if you're interested in being an entrepreneur yourself and contributing to this whole booming tech sector entrepreneur thing, um, consider joining the COZAD New Venture Competition, which is our campus-wide competition that takes place every year, and about 110 teams competed last year. Um, across the park, we think it's important, as I said, for people to talk to each other. So not only being technically good, but uh, integrated. So we do a whole lot of events. Um, this year, we're actually on track to do about 200 events. So it's perpetual, and we have everything from fun things like tomorrow night will be trick-or-treating. Um, we had pumpkin carving last Friday, but we also have events that are certainly more specific to the audience that we serve. So women in tech, as women are often underrepresented, as I'm in a room full of women, I noticed, aside from one, um, that women in tech are often represented in their respective, respective fields and may feel isolated, especially as entrepreneurs, if they're working as the only female in their businesses, or even the larger companies that's still typically uh, quite quite a small percentage. In the research park wide, um, we have 26% of the employees are female, which is actually um, doing quite well for many tech positions, which is an unfortunate statement still. Uh, but we are trying our best to recruit more women into the fields in the park, whatever scientific area it would be, and help support them um, through mentors and relationships that they would have with one another. Um, tomorrow, um, we, we are uh, having our, our last day of planning to get ready for a busy week next week, which is Big Data Day. So everybody I said is interested in Big Data Day. We'll have about 200 visitors here um, because of this Big Data event and bringing together many different topic areas. So we welcome you to join that as well. So lots of software types of things. Uh, the community itself, we talked about Information City, so I think Champaign is quite well known for its expertise in computing and increasingly being known for analytics themselves. Um, so we have somebody who just consults our companies on analytics. He has or did have an appointment here at GISLIS. Michael Welge was doing some research here related to um, both the humanities and informatics, but also NCSA, and has done collaborations with a number of areas on campus, including more recently in bioinformatics. And he works with a lot of our companies to help them understand what is informatics and what is big data, and how do you define that, not just as a term in a magazine article, but functionally within your organization. And then helping the actual developers that need additional skills. So if they want to use Hadoop to do a big data analysis, how do you go about doing that and so we have a lot of practical groups and in February we'll be launching a short course in big data um, Robert Bruner I think has been doing some work in online education with this college as well and he'll be teaching professionals at night um, additional skills and how to do everything from data collection data storage to analytical tools to um, how to do visualization and data driven decision types of dashboards that executives care about Sorry. Okay, so some startups, and I'll go quickly through these. Um, startups are fun to work with, but it's a challenge, of course, to take something out of the university and make it commercially successful. Um, the, these are a few examples. Um, this guy, Adam, finished his PhD, and he was in an, a lab that was doing work on algorithms to do precise movement of missiles which probably has 0% uh, chance of commercial success if they were to commercialize it in that form. But they saw something that was important, with, which is they could do physical activity recognition using their algorithms in a more precise way than most other software was capable of doing. 
So if they could tell the guidance of a missile very precisely, which the Department of Defense was funding, maybe they could apply that in something that was actually consumer oriented. So they pivoted completely and said, let's take like something like a Nike Fit Band and see how precisely we could track physical activity or movements. And there was a recent study that was done that showed that those types of devices, one person using one device counted 7,000 steps with one device on their hand. Another device they had on their other wrist said they walked 10,000 steps in the same day. And another device said they worked, walked 11,000 steps. So the precision of these are not very good. Uh, they may make you feel good about that you're tracking something, but there's an increasing appetite for people to have analytics in their own personal lives. So they took their technology that had come out of Coordinated Science Lab and made it so that you could train this little watch or various devices to track whether you were doing curls or jumping jacks or whatever it was. It can learn your activity in eight seconds, and then it gives you a little time if you've done it, or it can just count throughout the day and give you all the analytics of your physical performance. Um, interestingly, there was an interest in that technology being applied in things like robotics, precision, and other, other fields after they were able to prove it in something that was really a, a, attainable or easy to understand by people, which was these types of Fitbit types of devices. Um, they just raised a Series A funding round, um, which had a number of investors come together to support them. Uh, this company, Autoscout, is one that was just featured on ESPN, um, young team out at the research park that is taking some research that was developed through the University of Illinois' presence in Singapore, which does video analytics. Uh, I saw some really interesting work on campus recently between civil engineering and computer science that's in a similar type of space. But basically, you can take video images and be able to extract lots of information if you can translate the information, the video seeing, or pictures into actionable data. So on the screen, if you looked if I went in more precision, the video is able to track and numerically quantify. I saw this player, this player's number was number four. Number four equals John Smith, who's on the team. And John Smith just ran how many yards down the field? Well, in the, another, this, that's what this company does. And it's being used not only by the Illini, but other sports teams. Um, in this other application area, I was talking about um, Caterpillar's doing work of how do they use video to be able to detect what's happening in construction sites more, more accurately. And it's actually, as I was told, a fairly low cost data stream that they could collect and if they can do the translation of video content information. Another fun one is Luminous. So uh, at this campus, we're really good at computer vision. And it's pretty glitzy stuff to watch. Um, three graduate students that were getting their degrees in this area decided not to take job offers they had from large corporations, but to do a startup around virtual reality. So people that appear to be in places where they're actually not, or buildings coming alive, and being able to make that uh, more accessible. So if you go to a concert, you might see the whole stage come alive and the whole arena with different things for around you and they wanted to be able to make that experience possible in smaller settings and so that's the type of work that they do with virtual reality. Um, this one is a company that's expertise is in IT security, and um, so that's an area of strength on our campus. Um, we have several startups in that area where they're working on how to crack uh, essentially enterprise um, uh, systems to see if there's any faults in their systems. And they also have raised money and have industry partnerships in a very short amount of time. Another area where you'd see software integration, and I tried to pick more software examples for today's talk since it was information cities, and I thought that might be more of the theme. Um, ag informatics is one that we're happy to see growth because I think there's a very natural thing that should happen here, which is the expertise of ag inherently in central Illinois being married with engineering or informatics or other expertise areas that we have. So the ag companies seem to increasingly be coming to us and saying they want more precision in how growers can achieve results, not only at a big corporate side, but certainly the growers themselves want the ability to obtain data. And this is a company that sells direct to growers to help the individual farmer to be more efficient in their operations and have daily analytics of how the performance is going. Oops. Uh, this one, ooh, one more. One more fun one. Um, this one's not an IT company. It's a material science company, but it's one of our darlings right now because they're shipping a whole lot of product out. And there's nothing better than seeing a whole lot of boxes go out of the building, which means that's, that's a lot of sales happening. Their entire, their lab suite's about the size of this room, and it's 
almost all filled with boxes right now. Yesterday I could barely walk in the place because they had thousands of boxes ready to deliver product. And the story of that is that this was science developed at the University of Illinois by a professor, Jennifer Lewis. She's one of the best material scientists in the world in this type of work of creating conductive inks and a variety of other novel properties. She moved to Harvard and she took her lab with her research group essentially and she was going to do her startup company in Cambridge and everybody thinks of Cambridge as a city that's especially easy to do startup companies and she got there and she said she was so used to working in a smaller town where she knew everybody and the resources that were available that she and her team realized they actually missed the small town easy accessible things that had been put in place in Champaign-Urbana so they moved her postdoc moved back started the company in Enterprise Works our incubator and quickly thereafter they launched a Kickstarter campaign and if you're not familiar with that that's crowdfunding which has really changed the way some of companies are getting started we've had three kicks three crowdfunded companies out of the building in the last two years uh, where you put your video out there and consumers vote basically by pre-purchasing and then that enables your business to launch and they were wildly successful as you can see they raised six hundred and seventy four thousand dollars in January that was in 28 days their goal was eighty five thousand dollars they thought they would sell a small volume of these kits that allow kids primarily to do circuitry. They can draw with a ballpoint pen circuits. So you simply draw, do a little dot, and then you draw this uh, line, and then you can create things that sort of come alive with circuitry. So they create these circuit scribe kits, and they sold 15,000 of them in January before they had a real production capacity. They didn't know how they were going to make them, really. They ended up having to create partnerships in um, China for some parts, Japan for some parts. Some of it they would have to do here. And one of those little interesting things that you don't think about later is no pen manufacturer would put their ink in their pen machines because they said it had never been tried before, and they were worried it was going to clog it. So guess what? Students are filling lots and lots of pens in our building right now with conductive ink. Um, so they ended up having to ship all this product out. And in addition, they um, have uh, relationships with Autodesk. So Autodesk is makers of Adobe now selling their product. They're selling 2,000 of their products a week right now. So their capacity issues are significant, and it's been neat to see. Um, they also have relationships with, uh, they sell on Amazon, and they also are selling through some major retailers now. Um, so large companies, and I'll hit a few. Um, John Deere, as I'd mentioned, does employ students in the Graduate School of Library and Information Sciences. Uh, the reason they do that is that they have students working on research that typically might have been done in a corporate library, but then also across different business units. So what mergers and acquisitions should they pursue? What's the landscape of a particular product area where students can use journals and even in language they've said that's really important to them as a global organization that people could translate things in Chinese to be able to say um, in this market, what is the what are some of the nuances that we wouldn't pick up if it were translated that you could tell some sort of sentiment analysis of whether this company was a good partner or not or lawsuit research or things like that that might happen. Um, other increasing areas for them are looking at the farm of the future. They're doing things in various analytical capacity robotics and a few other types of projects as well. Um, Caterpillar just celebrated their 15-year anniversary, and they have added Gisla students as well as statistics students. They have a new analytics lab that they're in the process of building out. It's called Information Analytics, which is a growing area. I was just with them before this, and they were very proud of this growth that they've had, a company that was very stuck on mechanical engineering or actual equipment design, and seeing now that their product will change if they can do better analytics as well. Um, State Farm has a long history of doing analytics here with employment of 90 students at a time. Um, they work in areas of not only actuarial science, which is probably obvious, but they do applied statistics and analytical projects as well as market research out of this facility. And then they have uh, a variety of projects that are interdisciplinary in nature. Anheuser-Busch InBev is not only the biggest beer company in the world, but also the third largest consumer products goods company. And with thousands and thousands of products, they're trying to optimize those products in different markets or different marketing promotions that they would use or to do ag forecasting to know how much barley needs to be used or to be able to predict the weather so that they can understand consumption. And they do that with the help of many students and some researchers here. Um, one of the things they also have is one of 20 companies that has an open pipeline to Twitter data and they've been working with Jana Diesner out of this college to be able to make that more actionable so that they can do better marketing um, around things like sentiment analysis. 
Yahoo is our largest full-time employer in the research park. So an unusual story is we talk about geographic locations of why Yahoo chose here. They chose here because we have smart full-time engineers that are in this community. They hired a bunch that had been formerly with Motorola that all decided when they lost their job one day that rather than them all fend for themselves and find whoever would pay them the most, they would all band together and said, you have to employ all of us or we're not going anywhere. We want to stay in Champaign. And so Yahoo vied to get those employees and hired 100 of them in mass. And that was done in a 30-day time period, which is really remarkable. A lot of changes with the company since, but Yahoo says this is now the highest retention rates they have of all of their data pipeline engineers, um, and their Hadoop expertise is here. They shifted that from Sunnyvale, a core competency of the company, saying it was so critically important that it couldn't stay in California, which I love. Uh, it had to come to Champaign, where the workforce was stable and very skilled. And in addition to it being a software development type of operation, uh, they're not a research center formally here. They've had 50 patents out of this office, which kind of gives you some idea of the ingenuity and invention of the people who work here as well. Um, Dow Chemical works on software. I won't go into it in detail. Abbott works on nutrition infant formula ingredients. As an example, ADM works on new bio product, byproducts of biofuels, little fuse, fuses for electronics, the high power test lab, and the companies work with our startups. And so that's one of our key areas that we want to see more of is how do we integrate large and small companies together. So. Um, if you're interested in entrepreneurship and at uh, more of a statewide level, I'd note that one of the things that we've been doing is evaluating where are there other incubators and where are there successes throughout the state, the differences between rural communities, large city environments, and university communities, and how they support entrepreneurship. And so we recently released a study on that that was done with the Urban Planning Department, and it was quite interesting to see how those trends are emerging. Uh, Champaign-Urbana, um, we think is one of the emerging tech cities. We think it's an information city that matters because of what we've been able to develop over the last um, several decades of work by this community, working together with the university to create a thriving tech location. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry I talked too long. No, I don't think it's too fast at all. I have a couple of questions that I want to throw in once other people want to come to take a guess. All right. So okay. There's two things I, I wonder if we could talk about. One is, do you see any social entrepreneurship happening in the tech park? I mean, the tech park. I really just didn't even know what that is. And the other is, this is sort of a picture of a new champagne event. Yeah, literally, it was in mm -hmm. Southfield in 2000. Are there measures that you have that indicate the connection to the old campaign event? Mm -hmm. Like maybe that one measure might be the diversity of the workforce, the local, the, the local origin of the workforce. Or maybe there's other measures that I'm not even aware of to just see to what extent old champagne or better is, is is going through research park, or is this something entirely new? Is mm -hmm. really connected with the university, but not with the local community? I'll start with question one, which would be, I think you're getting, social entrepreneurs can often mean those that have some sort of social cause they're pursuing, or some sort of um, goodwill, changing the world uh, as part of their mission in addition to making money. And we've seen quite a bit of that in the park. Um, there are, uh, several faculty that are particularly good at that. Um, Brian Lilly in the College of Engineering has done a lot of work with students to develop products that are used in developing countries, um, which was everything from solar powered lamps that could bring light to places like rural India where they don't have it, to um, a new company that they just created called Sun Buckets with uh, Professor Litchfield in the College of Engineering that's trying to create um, solar powered stoves where you don't have electricity and cooking can be a considerable burden on populations that are trying to get firewood all during the day and if they had an ability to create another heat source that it matters and we just chose to give them give them some funding and they've gone through the i -Corp program. We had another student company working on prosthetic devices. So how in developing countries when a major um, natural disaster happens like an earthquake, do you get prosthetic devices to a population? Well, maybe they don't need to all be custom fit as they are right now and that you could create an adjustable prosthetic arm. And so they worked on that for um, NGOs. Um, we have another company that's currently in the incubator called IntelliWheels that's creating wheelchair wheels that make it easier to push. Um, it's a pretty simple um, concept was looking around campus, we have more wheelchair users than any other university and we have lots of people who ride bicycles to class 
and this mechanical engineer thought of the idea of why don't wheelchairs have gears? Um, it would make them easier to push. <laughs> and um, he created that with the thought that he would create an automatic transmission on a wheelchair, which NIH did just now fund, but that's not where they went first. Um, they actually started serving then a geriatric population and spent a lot of time here. They were students who probably weren't familiar with working with um, seniors in nursing homes, but that's exactly what they did. They went to a lot of nursing homes, including Clark Lindsay in town, and said, what are some of your challenges of your population and how do they use wheelchairs? Well, they found that people became sedentary because they were moved into an electronic, electric wheelchair, battery powered, and that once that happens, they really lost their sense of mobility and independence, and they're heavy and they can't get moved very easily. In addition, they no longer are considered to be independent and in living in some of the nursing home definitions. So if you can't wheel yourself or mo uh, propel yourself to dinner, essentially, you are no longer able to stay in some care facilities in assisted living. You have to go into skilled care, which is much more expensive. So these students were able, I think, what's great about working with them is to hear how they listened to the customer or the user and thought about how they could create something that would solve a pain point in their lives. So those are some examples. Um, um, Madhu Vishwatharan in the College of Business does a lot of work in this type of area as well, and some of our large corporations have been interested. So John Deere and Abbott and some of the other companies are increasingly see their markets grow in developing countries, and how do they create better farming conditions or other nutrition. Um, certainly Abbott is interested in nutrition in other areas. So that's kind of question one. Um, and it is important, I'd say, you know, in Telewheels, I love that they've done the work with Clark Lindsay, but they also have specifically said they want to source their parts and they manufacture everything with parts from a 30 mile radius. And even as young graduate students seeing that they had an impact on the economy if they could source locally and they have machine shops in Philo and one in Paxton, um, but they have uh, Villa Grove that they sourced from, so they said they wanted to be committed to doing something here that could create local manufacturing. Um, we see in Champaign-Urbana doing economic development assessment of different industries, and we recently did a study looking at the growth of what sectors are growing job jobs in Champaign-Urbana over the last 10 years and have the greatest path towards growth in the next 10. Um, we saw that um, the, the largest private sector employment is in retail and hospitality. It's in manufacturing, healthcare, technology. Problem with retail and lodging or hospitality being one of our biggest growth sectors is it's also one of our worst paying sectors. Um, the typical wage in that area is around somewhere around $11 an hour, say, and that doesn't create essentially a wage that increases economic prosperity in our community and usually um, also has some other social implications for the community. Um, so then you go to the next, which would be manufacturing, which generally has fairly high wages. And people don't think of Champaign as a manufacturing town, but it's some of our largest employment with craft as one of our biggest employers and others like Plasti Pack in town. Um, some of those are not high wage, but some are very much so. But unfortunately, manufacturing in Champaign was not unlike many other Midwest cities and had pretty precipitous decline in employment over the last 10 years. And the next 10, it's also forecasted to be declining. So I think there's modernization that can happen in manufacturing where technology can play a role. But unfortunately, some of the projections still at this time don't look particularly um, optimistic. Um, interestingly, in talking with the manufacturers in town, it's often skill sets that they're seeking that are at a higher level as well. So I do think the convergence of technology positions, for example, bell helmets that are produced in Rand Tool, they make an astonishing number that are, are sold all around the world, even high-end helmets used by bicyclists uh, for competitive sports. They said some of their key needs are supply chain management and engineers out of our university. So um, it's not just as simple as manufacturing. But the two sectors that are both high wages and high growth are the tech sector and healthcare in Champaign-Urbana. So those are where some of our emphasis has been of how do we attract workforce and how do we rally together as a community. So one of the endeavors that I'm working on is a campaign called You're Welcome, which we hope to launch um, in early spring, which is going to be kind of an, a little bit arrogant, a little bit irreverent campaign of all the great stuff that came out of Champaign-Urbana, you're welcome, and um, try to sell that in other markets as a reason to look at us as a community, and then not only talk about this of uh, stuff that came from here, like the LED or the web browser or MRI, uh, but then you're welcome to come to our community. And that effort, I'm proud to say, is not just Research Park, although we're helping to fund most of the initial um, creative development. Um, we have done so with a broad community coalition that's looking at how do we sell the community at large. And that meant employers like Wolfram and Volition and um, Frasca and others that have been more 
have been in the community for longer than the research park existed to band together around something to say we collectively win if we can sell ourselves as a cohesive community. So, we have that. So with economic development as a priority um, and sort of the campaign you just described, can you characterize briefly your relationship with the city governance in Champaign, Urbana, and county government as well? So the, that campaign development, we created a group that we loosely call CU Love, which was Champaign, Urbana Love, and attracting people to move here. We did not want to create a new governmental body to do that, and so we invited the other units of government to participate and had representation from each of them. Um, we are all, the research park itself is all located in the city of Champaign, and so obviously there's been overlap with their interests, and uh, there have been surprisingly few incentives needed necessarily from a governmental side to attract the company. It's usually they're here because of people and what they associate with the university. Um, but we also play a key role in the economy for the whole area and people don't live just in Champaign, they live in Urbana and uh, the companies are going to graduate not just out of the incubator into the research park but they move from Champaign to Urbana or they move from Champaign up by Parkland or other locations as well. So I think one of the most important roles that we play across our community is a generator of new companies that then can grow and prosper throughout the community and seeing that we support those areas as well. Um, the role of governments in some research parks is quite significant. In many cases, their counties or regional offices have funded research parks in some combination with um, universities. The only funding that we've had for the research parks um, from the cities themselves has been an incentive program that exists if somebody moves that hasn't been in town they get three dollars per square foot to help build out the construction of their space so that's one of the incentives that they've had and then we have the enterprise zones which are providing some tax abatement for a five-year period of time and we're within one of the Champaign County enterprise zones and work with the administration of that I don't know that that addresses your question but that's some of the work that we do with the local governance Thank you. Thank you.